For all that Raisha seemed absolutely determined to stick to his side during the short period of leave they had before she shipped off to the Avery, Jason recognised that her siblings wanted some alone time with their wayward kin. While the trio seemed enamoured with his presence, there was no mistaking that he was a veritable stranger to them. A certain level of reticence in his presence was only to be expected. Admittedly, that was less the case for Hilshra, but the stiltedness of the two younger siblings in his presence more than made up for the older sister's gregariousness. With that in mind, Jason had, not without some difficulty, slipped away from Raisha on the second day of their leave. The girl in question was sulking as he left, but he didn't miss the nod of thanks he received from Hilshran, which had left him in the city, with money in his bank account and little idea what to do with it. Which was how he'd found himself on a small ranch in the outskirts of the city, staring at what might as well have been a dinosaur. That's a Turox? Yep, drawled the farmhand, who was being totally unsubtle in eyeing him up and down. He didn't care. His eyes were on the dinosaur. The thing was about the size of a cow, but that was about all they had in common. It looked like some kind of demonic fusion between a dog and a crocodile. All scales, teeth, and bad attitude. This was what he had been eating for months? I thought it would look like a cow, he said slowly. No idea what one of those is, the woman said simply. He turned to look at her. And you used to ride them? Still do, she said, gesturing to what he now realised were armoured plates sewn into her overalls. Jason stared. How? The Shulfanti made a so-so gesture. Not exactly easy, I'll admit. She gestured to the reinforced heavy-duty grill strapped over the front of the Turok's face. The trick, such as it is, she said, is to accept that the most deeply held desire of that big girl in there is that one day an opportunity will arise that would allow her to finally sink her teeth into the last person to try and climb on her back. She smiled down at him. Once you get over that, it's not so hard. Jason smiled at the joke. She did not. You're not joking, are you? She shook her head. Nope. Jason turned back to the massive animal that was thrashing against the bars of his cage. He could see the rage burning in its inhuman gaze. So, you want to get on or not? The woman asked. I uh, need to make a phone call real quick. He didn't wait for her to respond, as he woodenly stepped out of the Turok's pens and back into the midday sun. Perhaps he would find something else to do on his day off. Shulvanti pony rides were a bit too intense for his taste. Maybe he'd find something less dangerous to do to relax. Like skydiving. No, look, the problem is we don't have nice things, Jason said, before taking another swig of his drink. Since the Imperium arrived, we've got lots of nice things. The problem is that we've got no say in anything. He was in a bar. Given what had happened on the last two occasions he had visited a bar, one would think that he tried to stay away. Unfortunately, Jason was nothing if not stubborn, which was why he was now sitting at a counter, telling his new drinking buddy all about his issues with the Imperium. I don't get it, the woman in question admitted. Life's better, but you're unhappy? She sounded more bemused than anything else, which only stoked Jason's indignance higher. It's not about how nice things are, it's how unpleasant things could get. He slammed his drink down. Because we don't have a say in anything. Some duchess could wake up to her and suddenly decide the population of some city has to be moved off world to make way for, I don't know, a palace or something. He waved his hand. And with the way things currently are, ain't no one can say shit to stop her. The news said the governors of Earth is currently a joint effort, his friend whose name he couldn't quite recall pointed out. Jason scoffed, nearly spilling his drink. Oh, sure. You guys kept as much government infrastructure in place when you arrived, all part of keeping things from being too disruptive during the transition. But no one with two brain cells to rub together is fooled. No one you've got a Shulvanti advisor sitting in every government department worth a damn. His new friend looked amused. You say you, but between the two of us, you're more related to the current administration than me. She gestured to her reasonably nice and undoubtedly expensive jacket. I'm an independent businesswoman after all. The closest things I have with the government are when I pay my taxes. Jason scoffed, but the woman's words did sting a bit, because they were true. He was a marine now, one of the Empress's lapdogs. Wasn't my idea, he mumbled under his breath didn't have a choice. Pardon? He sighed. Nothing. The businesswoman just shrugged. 
Besides, you say that humanity has no say in anything, but it's not like it's any different for us Shilvanti. You're either a born a noble and have a say in things, or you're a peasant who just has to accept that that's how it is and move on. She took a sip of her own drink. Besides, look at the Rakiri. They fought us for years, despite the fact that their ecosystem was on the verge of total collapse. Look at them now. They were as healthier than ever, but they're a respected part of the Empire. Jason barely heard the woman's second statement. He was still focused on the first. Humans aren't very good about just accepting that that's how it is. Well, you're the only one I've ever met, so I'll have to take your word for it. She smiled. Lucky me, I suppose. I know there's a lot of people who are waiting with bated breath for the travel ban on Earth to be lifted, yet here I am getting a sneak peek of humanity before anyone else. She leaned forward, though I wouldn't mind giving you a closer inspection.